book of Proverbs, chapter number 11. <clears throat> Proverbs, chapter number 11. I'm going to read one verse and give you a thought that the Lord's laid on my heart. God will help us and you'll listen. I promise not to split any doctrinal hairs this afternoon. <laughs> The stuff we're talking about this morning may not mean much to a lot of people, but that's serious business. Amen. Amen. And uh, even in the Baptist world, in the Baptist circles, preaching about that and exposing the dangers of that has put our church and me and some other churches and preachers that I know has put us in a category of people where well, they're just contentious or they're just... Uh, nap gaggers or hair splitters uh, but the problem is is we've, we've noticed we've, we've discovered that there is a confusion that goes along with not explaining the Bible properly and uh, and I still think we're on the right side of that and, uh, I, I promised I wouldn't do it again we're not going to do. Proverbs chapter number 11 verse number 1 the Bible says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. A false balance. In Solomon's day, the balance was simply a set of scales, and I'm sure most of you know this. It was a set of scales that they would weigh out gold or silver in, and, uh, and, and this, this was a financial device. This was a a business device and they would uh, they would lay out gold or silver and that's how much you knew to pay or to receive as payment uh, in business transactions. This concept of weighing out is used all throughout the scripture. Genesis chapter 23 and verse 16 Abraham weighed out a certain amount of money to pay for the burial plot that he was buying to bury Sarah, his wife. In Numbers chapter number 7, the tabernacle being completed, the princes of Israel bring their offerings to the tabernacle and it was weighed out. That's, uh, that's what that was talking about. They were weighing out gold and silver. In Joshua chapter 7, you probably remember the story of Achan. Achan took of the accursed thing. The Bible says what was the accursed thing, well, part of it included, uh, part of it included 400 shekels of, no, that's not right. Part of it included gold of 50 shekels weight, the Bible says. 50 shekels of weight. Of course, Zechariah, we find the prophecy of, the, uh, of, of Judas betraying the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver, and it says it was weighed out was weighed in the balance, in the scale. What they would do is, is they would put a standard weight on one side, and we're talking about those scales, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Amen. <clears throat> they would put a standard weight in one side, perhaps a stone or something like that, that had been tried and proven, they knew how much it weighed, and they would use that as a standard so when they poured the gold or the silver in the other side, when it balanced out, it was a true weight. It was just and it was fair. Uh, and that's the way it was done. It would be easy enough, it would have been easy enough to alter the stone, to chip some of the stone off or whatever it is that they're using as a standard or to alter the scales in some way as to give an unfair advantage to one party or the other. This is what our proverb, this is what Solomon is talking about in this proverb. And this kind of activity is expressly forbidden in the Word of God. Let me, re let me read to you Deuteronomy chapter number 25 and verse number 13, 14, 15 and 16. Thou shalt not have in thy bag divers weights, a great and a small, 
You see, they would use the great to get an advantage one way and the small to give an advantage the other way. He said, don't do that. Verse 14, thou shalt not have in thine house divers measures, a great and a small. But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. A perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. That's what the proverb, that's what Solomon is writing about in this proverb. He's trying to tell us it is not, it is not wise to be dishonest and unfair. For us, in our day and time, it would be like going to Walmart and the total is 75 cents. Anybody ever spent 75 cents at Walmart? This is the illustration. It would be more like 75,000. <laughs> I told Frank, just direct deposit my check to Walmart. <laughs> 75 cents is the bill. You put a $1 bill on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the checkout counter, and they say, no, this, this dollar bill is only worth 75 cents. You don't get any change back. Well, that's kind of a bad illustration. In our day and time, a dollar probably is only worth 75 cents. This would be a better illustration, I guess, is, is if the bill was $10 and you stick your ATM card in there and it charges $10.50. Right. An unfair or an unjust advantage. This proverb is a plea for, fair, uh, for fairness and honesty in the people of God, understanding that we're not always going to be treated with fairness and honesty. Before we get into the points of this, there is something here that I think is worth. I think is worthy of our attention in dealing with this subject of fairness and honesty. Solomon points out. He says that dishonesty. Uh, look at how he labels it here. He doesn't say it's a sin unto the Lord. He doesn't say it's a transgression unto the Lord. Those are legal terms, but what he says is, is fair, unfairness and dishonesty is, a, is an abomination unto the Lord. He goes on there in verse 1 to talk about that a just way is, is His, the Lord's, that is, it's His delight. An abomination or delight, these are not legal terms or legal words, they're words of emotion. Did you know that God is an emotional being? And it's good for us to be reminded that when we sin and we transgress the law of God, uh, that, that, that it's not just a legal infraction on our part, but our sin grieves the heart of God. It's good for us to be reminded that our sin moves the Lord to grieve. I'm talking about the one, we talked this morning about catching a fresh glimpse of the cross, when we get tore up over how much God loved us and tore up over His goodness and His mercy and His grace, it causes us to not want to disappoint our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. It's not wise to be dishonest and unfair. Amen. Verse number 27 of chapter 11 here in Proverbs says, He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, but he that seeketh mischief, it shall come to him. It's not wise to be dishonest. I thought about a false balance. Number one, if you're taking notes, I thought about a false balance in our business affairs. That's primarily, contextually, what the proverb is talking about. It is wise, it is good to be fair and honest in our business deals. Why, preacher? Because, first of all, foolishness will find you out. You know, in the big cities there are certain safeguards for the people that live there against dishonest businessmen. 
But out here in Highland, out here in rural Texas, it's a little bit different. People want to deal with people they trust out here. In the construction world, the construction business, you know, if you operate in a big city, you never have to work for the same guy two times in a row. You can rip off every customer that you've got and never run out of customers. That's not the way it is out here. The guys that are in the construction business and have been out here can testify in, in rural areas like ours, your business depends on repeat customers. People that will use you a second time. And trust is everything out here where we live. How many times can you rip somebody off and still uh, still have a customer? I'll tell you something. In, in my world, anyway, I can tell you it only takes one foolish act. And, you're, and you may be out of business completely. Because the word gets around out here. But here's the thing. Even if nobody else finds out about it, God will find out about it. Chapter 11 and verse number 4 and, uh, and the first part it says riches profit not in the day of wrath. When God finds out about this what everything that you gain in business by your dishonest and unfair dealings not going to matter too much when God's had His gut full of it. How we conduct our business in this world is a means of witnessing Christ to the lost. At the end of verse 30, you'll recognize this verse, He that winneth souls is wise. Can't tell you how many times I've come out of Higginbotham's or Pates or McCoy's and they only charged me for one of any certain thing, and I may, well, I may have gotten a hundred of them. And if I know that that happened, we go back in there and tell them, hey, you, you mischarged this. It's not right. You... And I remember Kay Del Bosky, and I'm not saying she's of the lost world. I'm just saying that she's the one that told me this. She told me one time I went back in there, and she said, you may well be the only person in the world that would have come back in and told it and fixed that mistake. That's a, that's a shame that it has to be that way. It ought to be a Christian instinct that if we have unfair advantage over somebody in a business deal, that we go back and make that right. Paul said it like this. I think it was Paul. He said, we are ambassadors for Christ. We represent the, the, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings in this world. It is foolish for a believer to lead someone to hell just because we had a greedy spell one day. I thought about number two, a false balance in preaching and pastoring. Verse number nine might be a good, uh, a good verse to pull out here. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor. The pastor of the church, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3, tells pastors to be an example unto the flock or an example to the flock. And, and I want to set a good example for the flock, but I hope you understand, I'm not the standard for righteousness. Jesus is. Sometimes the pastor will foolishly set himself up to be the standard. If you'll live like I live, if you'll do what I do, if everybody had their house in order like I do, you understand the foolishness of that. Sometimes the church will foolishly set their pastor up to be the standard of living in the church. I'd be a hypocrite to say that I've got it all just right. I'm supposed to Keep things in the right order. It's supposed to be God first and then family and then ministry after that. I tell you right now, I don't always get that just right. 
If we're using the pastor as the standard of righteousness and living, we're using a false standard. We're using a false balance. Jesus is our standard. Number three, I thought about a false balance in church life. Verse number 14 might go good here. Where no counsel is, the people fall. Our church life. We need to make sure that we have the <coughs> right standard, that we have the right balance and weight. First of all, I thought about in our attendance to church. I've discovered that the standard that a lot of church members use that they are weighing to balance out their involvement in the church is the balance of, well, hey, this is what other people do. And I go to church as much as some folks do. And I've talked to people about church attendance in the past. They say, well, that's the way I was raised. Well, just because your mom and daddy didn't come to church doesn't excuse you. I talked to preachers and asked the question, why did you retire from the ministry? Why did you retire from the pulpit? And sometimes they'll start talking about, well, brother so-and-so did it that way. Brother so-and-so, his ministry went that way. Listen, I'm not saying that it's wrong for a preacher to retire, so don't put words in my mouth. But I can't find anywhere in our Bible where it says that when you get to a certain mile marker in your life that it's okay just to quit on God. Can't find it in there. Now I understand about changes and different responsibilities and all of that when you get older. But listen, old people, God's not asking you to slow down and to quit. He's asking you to do, you ought to be doing more. You ought to be doing more. What about a false balance in our doctrine? Sometimes I think preachers drop too many names when they're in the pulpit. That's why I hesitate. I may tell you some guy said this or this guy said that or one guy I found said this. I rarely drop any names because I don't want you to go out and, and, and think that I'm endorsing everything they ever said. There, there's a danger in that. <coughs> Uh, because just because a man said one good thing doesn't mean I'm encouraging you to read his book and to just take everything he says as the gospel. People in our day stuck on John MacArthur. Most of you heard who John MacArthur is, and I'm not here to bash him. I've listened to a lot of what he has to say and what he's written, and some of it's good. It's, some of it's real good. But he's a five-point Calvinist, in case you didn't know that. He's not a Baptist, in case you didn't know that. Well, preacher, they sell his book at Lifeway. They also sell Catholic collars down there at Lifeway. <laughs> what about D.L. Moody? People always quote D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was not a Baptist. But, but he said some good things. I agree, but he wasn't a Baptist. Billy Sunday was a high-powered evangelist. Everybody's got a favorite Billy Sunday quote. He was a Presbyterian. <laughs> Billy Graham. Everybody's got a book and a quote by the great Billy Graham. And, and in some ways, I think he was a great man. Let me tell you what church he belonged to. The Church of the Monk. Yeah, that's right. Whatever church and whatever town he was in, <coughs> Whatever political figure that he could find, that's the church that he went to. Dr. W. A. Criswell is a great Baptist and a pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, but he was a convention man. He was all about supporting missionaries through the cooperative missions program. I said all that to say this, though, though these men be spiritual giants, we do not use any man's standard for weighing out our doctrine. We Amen. use the Bible. Amen. We get our doctrine from the Bible. What about the right balance in the giving of our tithes and our offerings? Who sets the standard for 
uh, for church giving. One of the greatest Christian men that I've ever known in my life was a uh, was a penny pincher. Can I tell you that? I mean, a penny pincher. The way he figured his tithe was is after he bought all of his groceries and after he paid his car payments and after he paid every bill that, that came in the mailbox, whatever was left over, he paid his 10% on that. Is that what the Bible teaches us to do? Give 10% of the leftover? This church here, our Highland Baptist Church, has had teachers in the past that taught against tithing. They taught against it. Well, they're not the standard, though. They're not the standard. We, we have the right standard for giving in the Word of God. The Word of God says give of the first fruits, give of the increase, not the leftovers. Not after you've done everything else you want to do and spend all the money you want to spend, but of the increase. The Bible is our standard. Well, let me give you one more. What about, number four, a false balance in morality? Verse number three, Proverbs 11 says, The integrity of, an upright, of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. False balance in morality. Listen to me close. I, I, I'm not going to preach everything I want to preach into this point, but if society sets the standard for our morality, we're in big trouble. The world's standard for sexual morality is way off. Uh, it's not a true weight. It's not a true balance. But we have that we have a balance. We have a just weight in the Word of God. The Bible sets the boundaries for, uh, for sexual purity. Uh, the Bible calls it marriage. Marriage, the marriage bed is undefiled, it says in the book of Hebrews. Marriage. The Bible makes the qualifications for sexual purity. Purity, one man and one woman married. This idea in our society that two of the same gender can enter into a blessed and holy union and be happy and live happily ever after. Let me tell you something, that is a farce. In the, in the homosexual community, it is a proven fact that alcohol and drug abuse is rampant. It has to be. That's the only way they can deal with that lifestyle. That's the only way you can mentally cope with that lifestyle. One man and one woman. I still believe in that, don't you? You have a preacher of the Bible... It's full of Bible characters that had multiple wives. Well, if you want to try that, sir, you go out and help yourself, I guess. <laughs> I think Solomon was the idiot in that respect. <laughs> think of all of them mother-in-laws he had. Good night, nurse. <laughs> Let me tell you something about Bible characters and their multiple wives. The Bible makes record of this for a historical record, but you'll never find where the Bible ever condones it. And in fact, in a lot of the cases, you'll find where the Bible also records what problems it caused in their marriage. If we're going by the world's standards for, for morality, we're in trouble. And by the way, that's good talk for somebody that, if somebody needed to be saved because whenever we measure our morality, we're not using the world as our standard. Most people can tell you what, and when you talk to them about being saved, they can tell you what sin is, but when you start asking them, well, do you think you're one of them? They're not so sure about that. And the reason is, is because they've been taught that then it's been ingrained in kids' minds 
to use the world as a standard. Our favorite thing to say is, is well, I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as they are. The problem is, is other people are not our standard for morality. God is our standard of righteousness. Let me tell you how it is when you get saved. When you get saved, it's, it's coming to a realization that I may be righteous in some ways, but listen, I'm not anywhere close to the righteousness of God. I may look righteous compared to somebody else, but I'm not righteous when you compare me to God. What are we using as our standards of measurement? When we choose to weigh our decisions and our actions as Christians based upon something other than God's Word, it's not only a sin, but it grieves the heart of God. It's an abomination. It's foolish to set God's truth aside and weigh our decisions that we make with the standards of this world. It brings chastisement upon us. It causes us to miss opportunities to be a witness for Him in this world. What is it that pleases God? Well, it tells us here at the end of verse number 1 that the Lord's delight is a just way. What is it that pleases God? It is when His people who are called by His name make a decision, a determination. I'm not going to order my life based upon what this world says is, is acceptable, but I'm going to build my house upon the rock of the Word of God. I'm going to take my counsel from the Word of God. I'm going to use the Bible as my standard and when it goes against the grain of this world, all I know to say is, is, is let God be God and every man a liar. <coughs> what are we using as our standard? The Bible says that the Lord is not happy with a false balance. False balance. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you again for this day you've allowed us to be in your house to spend some time in your word, Lord, to spend some time lifting up your name and singing praises to you, lifting up our hearts to you, Lord, we thank you for that. It caused us to sit in heavenly places and we thank you for that. Lord, we just pray that preaching of your word, that, we, it might, that your word might find a lodging place in our hearts, that we might be able to use it to help us to serve you better this week. Lord, we pray for uh, Miss Darlene and the family that uh, my Brother Frank. Lord, I ask you to bless them in this time. I ask you to bless the service tomorrow. Give me the words you'd have me to preach. Help us as a church to be an encouragement to them. Lord, maybe point some lost person to Jesus. And uh, we ask you to help us to do that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>